Good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting in 2018 of the Social Security Committee and can I remind everyone to turn mobile phones and other devices to silence so they don't disrupt the meeting or the broadcasting. Um, <laughs> good timing. Um, uh, agenda item one is to decision to take items in private and the committee asks to agree that item three consideration of the evidence and items four and five which are private papers from the clerk are taken in private as the committee agreed thank you uh, agenda item two is um, an evidence session on passport should benefits and we welcome today rob gowans policy officer from citizens advice scotland michael mcmahon campaigns and policy policy manager disability agenda scotland and Bill Scott, Director of Policy Inclusion Scotland. And thank you very much also for your written submissions um, for today's meeting. Um, if I could um, open up questions today, um, just by asking whether um, you consider that at some point devolved benefits um, should continue to be linked to receipt of reserved social security issues, or, or do you think, or what you think about going forward about the link between social security reserve benefits and the current passported benefits in Scotland? <laughs> okay. okay. Rob. Uh, Rob, yes. <laughs> I mean, I think in general, the um, the link between um, um, social security benefits, whether they're reserved or, or devolved and passported benefits is Im important. Um, in many cases, it serves as a good um, a good proxy for um, um, for low income that um, that somebody would be in need of them and does prevent the need for a kind of a further a further means test um, for people. Um, I think there's um, there's going to be um, there be some some complexities, but um, there yes, there there already would be complexities from um, having passport ported benefits, which can be delivered by by local authorities, by the Scottish government, based on um, based on sort of UK government um, UK government um, reserve benefits. Um, some are delivered by um, by other agencies, um, such as the. The sort of warm home discount and um, and BT basics. So, um, so it's um, I think it's, it, it may it may present complexities, but but there are already complexities in the system. Mr. Scott, you were. Um, I think I very much agree with Rob that uh, the the link is a decent, uh, if imperfect, uh, proxy for poverty and low income, um, as well as disability, um, and of course with the devolution of most disability benefits to Scotland. Um, if there are some complexities in that area, they could be ironed out um, at a Scottish level. Um, but, but certainly in terms of low income benefits like uh, free school meals, um, I don't think that there's a better proxy uh, at the moment. And yeah. I agree that the, there is a complexity regardless of who um, owns the, the initial benefit, um, <clears throat> no, no passported benefit will ever come um, completely uh, without uh, some um, criteria being affected. Um, that, I think that's a given. Um, I think what we would like to see, regardless of, of what the, the passported benefit is linked to, uh, would be clarity on what purpose the passported benefit would have. Um, what, was the, what would the purpose be? So if, if the committee, the parliament, the government could, could ensure that uh, whether it's to try and address low income or, or poverty, whether it's just to provide assistance um, to people who, who require assistance because of disability or whatever, or both, I think clarity around that would be helpful um, in ensuring that whatever passport benefits are delivered, whatever they're connected to, wouldn't be the major issue. Um, I wonder if I, I could, could just, as a supplementary, ask about the recent court case down south about people on higher level disability who um, are, are now to receive a back payment that um, is being delayed. Um, and my understanding is that although there's, they will eventually, after the summer, receive a back payment for the disability, they are not being compensated for the loss of the passported benefits. I wondered if you knew how many people in Scotland had been affected by that, that situation or... 
and, and, and if you had an idea of, of, of what the, 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 um, the loss of earnings could be for someone affected by it? It's really difficult at the moment to tell exactly how many will um, be impacted by that um, because the DWP are conducting a trawl through all the cases to identify at the moment who may have been affected by that decision. Um, and there potentially up to 220,000 people are affected at a UK level. And that would translate roughly into around 21, 22,000 in Scotland because there's a higher proportion of uh, disabled people in Scotland uh, than throughout the rest of the UK. So it could be quite a large number of people who are unable to access passport benefits at the moment. And it was actually a point that, that we raised um, earlier in submissions um, several years ago and was addressed in terms of concessionary travel, uh, that a lot of people um, transferring across from uh, disability living allowance to personal independence payment. They're the ones who are currently going through this trawl um, and it was uh, a very large proportion of those affected have mental health issues, learning difficulties, autism, etc. Um, so th they've been disproportionately impacted by, um, by this and uh, luckily some of these issues were addressed uh, in concessionary track travel in terms of granting people with a long-term mental health condition and with learning difficulties uh, at least limited rights to concessionary travel uh, based on their condition. Um, we'd like to see that slightly broadened so to take care of that in the future because at the moment it depends on whether the person um, is actually receiving mental health treatment um, and travelling to that um, but they, they retain the concessionary travel regardless of whether the journey is to the mental health treatment or not. Um, and also for uh, somebody with a learning disability that they're required to travel to see a support worker. Now, we don't think that that's right and fair, that they have, you know, um, if the support worker travels to see them, <laughs> they then don't get concessionary travel. Um, and um, as I say, a large number certainly we would expect several thousand have probably missed out on that passport benefit in the meantime. Okay. Um, does anyone else want to comment on that one? That's fine. Um, I'm going to bring in uh, Ruth Maguire. Thanks, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I'd like to ask you about um, passporting from Universal Credit. We've obviously gathered um, your written evidence, but for the, the record here, um, just your reflection on whether passported benefits should be available to everybody in receipt of Universal Credit, and um, or whether they should all have income thresholds, and just anything you want to say about those thresholds. You know, one parent family, Scotland, described them as arbitrary, so I'd be interested to hear your opinion. There's certainly, um, um, certainly Universal Credit pre presents a challenge for um, um, assessing um, at what point um, somebody's, somebody's income um, would, it, would qualify for, them for a passport benefit um, because um, it's um, a lot of the, the existing passport benefits would be based on the, the legacy benefit system where um, be for for particular purposes if somebody was out of out of work due to ill health um, then um, then everyone on that benefit could qualify um, because universal credit um, uh, takes in sort of six of the existing benefits then um, then income thresholds have been set um, I think we um, set out in our evidence that they you know written a submission that um, that there's a range of um, of different different incomes that have been that have been set from um, from um, everyone on universal credit qualifying in the case of the best start grant um, and funeral payments um, um, to six hundred and ten pounds a month for free school meals um, one thousand two hundred and fifty pounds a month for help with prison visiting costs four hundred and thirty five pounds for help with um, with NHS costs and NHS vouchers and in the current um, reserved healthy start scheme four hundred and eight pounds so it's it's not, um, um, in some cases, it's not entirely, um, people might, um, might be on universal credit and qualifying for a whole range of different benefits at different, different times. Um, if there was a, a more consistent um, threshold, that would be, 
um, that would be helpful in terms of um, being able to um, work out easily what what passported benefit support somebody might be might be entitled to. Um, and I think the um, the other issue that um, um, that we'd raise around this is because there's no unlike the legacy benefits, there's no um, physical award letter printed off for universal credit. Then um, sort of authorities need to need to consider what what evidence they would take of of someone's universal credit award. Um, um, for instance, some some local authorities have taken to um, doing a, um, a printout of of someone's online journal instead of a instead of an award letter. Um, in an ideal world, that would um, there would be sort of some automated information sharing sharing element to that, and that's that's something that um, that we will be we will be in favour of as well. I think as far as a major concern is the threshold being set that, that create cliff edges. That um, people fall, you know, the income can can end because of minor changes uh, in their circumstances, and, and to avoid those scenarios is, is a, a real emphasis that we would like to see in, on the system. Um, the setting of arbitrary levels can always be contested, but you can look to see where you can avoid major problems for um, for low-income families and and ensuring that there's no cliff edges for them to fall off because of minor changes. Do you think the thresholds are set correctly at the moment, or do you think they need to change? I think it's too low uh, for free school meals, for example. Um, at the moment, it's set around 16 hours, 17 hours on uh, minimum wage. Um, and for a lone parent, um, they could be required to work up to 25 hours on pain of um, having a benefit sanction if they don't take up the extra hours offered. But to give an ex a, a concrete example of the cliff edge, and, and I, I would admit that this is a rough back-of-the-envelope calculation, so if somebody works it out more exactly, fair enough. But um, based on some of the figures supplied by CPAG, um, a lone parent f with four children, uh, all of school age, um, who did increase their hours from 16 hours to 25 hours would actually be worse off after, after the increase in hours. So although their earnings would rise by about £3,000 a year, because of the clawback from universal credit, about two-thirds of that, uh, and then the additional school meal costs, which could are over £400 a year for each child, they'd actually be worse off. Um, and you know, even for a three-child family, they're barely better off over, over the uh, entire year. And, and I think that that has implications. I mean, we, we had more deaths than births in Scotland uh, over the winter months this year. Um, and that, you know, causes me and should cause everybody in this room who's older quite a bit of concern because, you know, it, it's not just immigration that can cause a population to grow, um, it's also the birth rate. And we seem to be penalising families who have more than two children at the moment. Um, and yet, we could be dependent on those children as tax, you know, uh, taxpayers and care providers, NHS staff, teachers, etc. in the future. Um, so, you know, these large families just now who are being penalised, people seeing that are going to avoid that complication if they can and, and reduce probably the birth rate even further. And we, we're going to face real problems uh, in a generation from now. Um, but, you know, definitely these cliff edges need to be addressed. And I, I think, you know, I, I would prefer to see universal credit as, as a passport to free school meals for all children in those families because the retention of universal credit by, for example, a family with a disabled child or a disabled parent who's on a higher income, you know, from earnings, is because of the extra costs of disability. So they're getting more money from the state because the state recognises that they, you know, they're penalised by these additional costs. And then the state is taking that money back through school meal charges or hospital visits or, or whatever. So, you know, 
if, if we can't abolish you know, the thresholds at all, I think we really do need to seriously look at them and standardise them at a higher level than, than is currently the case um, because I think they are penalising a lot of low-income families. Thank you, that's interesting. I think that comes back to the point about the clarity of what the passport had been, in fact, what all benefits are for as well, doesn't it? Thanks, Camina. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bromfer? No, I mean, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, good morning, you. gentlemen, and thank you all for coming. Uh, my questions are really probably to start off uh, with, with you, Rob, if that's okay. And it's around your submission, which I find um, interesting reading. And in particular, I just wanted to get a wee bit more information on your views around the new um, Scottish disability benefits and mobility. Um, and you, you suggest that there's a, an argument that those who aren't on the high rate PIP mobility should um, still be entitled to a, an award of a car. Could you just explain a bit more about how that would work and any costing behind that? So that was, it was basically, um, that was a suggestion that came out of um, some consultation that we've, we've done with CAB advisors and clients. Um, since the, the transition from, from DLA to PIP, um, there's been a, a sort of large number of people who have um, who've lost um, access to the, the motability scheme um, because um, they haven't um, been receiving the, the top mobility rate of PIP, whereas they were, they were in, in DLA. And um, this is... Um, this has caused a number of, of issues for people, in, in particularly in, in rural areas where, um, where um, it's sort of, they might not have the um, um, access to, to public transport to, to get them where, where they want to go. Um, and um, it, can, it can cause a real barrier for people's, um, people's ability to, um, to get around. Um, one of the, the suggestions that um, um, we have made is that it it might be that um, that um, somebody pays um, something extra towards the cost of mobility. In, in some cases, if um, if they're on a, a sort of lower um, lower rate of um, lower rate of mobility, um, to give um, more people access to the the motability scheme, which is um, um, which is very popular, and I think that um, um, I think that that we've seen that sort of um, clients really. Really appreciate the um, um, the benefits it can it can bring, um, but I think in the I mean we would um, we would be keen um, with the the new disability benefits to um, to change the um, uh, to change the um, the qualifying conditions for um, for receiving the enhanced mo mobility component um, to being able to walk. Um, Walk less than than 20 metres, which is um, um, similar to the um, threshold in in DLA, which um, I think is a, a sort of fairer um, fairer assessment of um, of somebody's mobility needs, which would really then qualify qualify someone for for the motability scheme. Uh, and I think you also argue that in your paper or suggest that at the moment you can't get um, a mobility scheme where you can't get high rate. Uh, PIP if you're over 65 um, they've that cut off uh, again are you suggesting in your submission I think I read was that actually that arbitrary date should be removed and anyone of any age should get or be at least be able to apply for that and again have you got any costings of how much that would cost to do it shouldn't cost anything uh, to do it what I think what CAS are, are arguing is that the mobility scheme is opened up to people who are on uh, lower, potentially lower rate um, mobility PIP um, and, and are unable to walk 50, 50 metres, um, which was the old test um, for higher rate um, mobility in DLA. Um, because in Scotland, around, according to projections, which look, by the way, to be pretty accurate at the moment, um, around 46, 47,000 people will lose entitlement to higher rate of mobility 
when transferred from DLA to personal independence payment. So there are, there are a very large proportion of people in, uh, who are currently entitled who are, who are going to lose that entitlement, almost 50%. Um, now, what they do at the moment is they lease cars from the mobility scheme, so they pay for them. There's, you know, there is no public subsidy as such. It's the benefits that pay for the leasing of the car. So if you allow, opened up eligibility to apply to lease a car, it would still be benefit, at least, but you might then have to top that up with payments potentially from earnings, potentially from other benefits. And a lot of disabled people would like to be able to do that, as would older disabled people who only qualify for attendance lines because their impairment, the onset of their impairment or the, uh, you know, the, the decrease in their mobility happens after they're 65 when they're only able to claim attendance lines. My mother's one of those people. My mother, my mother qualifies for the highest rate of attendance lines but can't lease a mobility vehicle. So it's what she would do would be to use her attendance allowance payment to pay for the, the leasing of a vehicle rather than to pay for taxis and things like that. So, so what you're suggesting, okay, I, so if you're not suggesting then, uh, and I think that's helpful to clarify, you're not mm. suggesting then that people who are over 65 should be allowed to apply for the mobility component of PIP. You, all you're saying is that they, they, they take the benefit that they're entitled to already, and rather than use it for, as you say, taxes or for yeah. care or whatever, they use that to then yeah. um, use it to go towards the car. Yeah. And, and that would be true for those who are presumably on um, the different, the, the, the lower rate of PIP yeah. uh, for care, rather than just using it, they could then buy yeah. into that scheme as well. Yeah. Is, is, I'm that, not, is that correct? I'm, I'm not necessarily arguing against extending PIP in to over 65s, but what I'm saying, even under the, the current system, the restriction on eligibility restricts older disabled people from being, being able to exercise rights that younger mm. disabled people mm. of working age can do. And I just think that a lot of older people would like that ability to lease a car because it is, you know, now with out of town shopping centres, etc., it's so much more difficult to access, you know, shops unless you have that especially if you're you know if you're my, my, my mum's had two knee replacement operations and has got arthritis in her spine it, it's incredibly difficult for her to get across the shops 200 yards away you know so it's um it's something that a lot of older disabled people would like is is to see eligibility for to be able to lease mm -hmm. extended to them okay okay i think that's helpful because that, that clarifies yeah. a bit what i've I, I'm afraid. Just a couple of very quick questions. Just following up the other point just made by you, uh, Bill, in regard to um, those who have lost um, the car because of the change in regulations, um, do you have figures of those who have now got the car, particularly those perhaps with um, mental health issues who were never entitled to it before because they could never get in? Has there been any work done to know how many more people have now got the car who are affected by mental health issues, who, were, who weren't entitled under the old DLA? No, and, and, and again, that's partially because of this decision last year. Because that decision essentially said that people uh, who needed to be accompanied on most of their journeys um, could qualify for uh, the, the higher rate of PIP. The review will change the figures quite considerably um, because as it stood, around 34% of people with mental health issues lost all entitlement to PIP altogether, um, including uh, any mobility um, award that they had. So that will change quite dramatically um, after, after that sifting has been conducted and after those backdated awards have been made. But of course, in the, you know, you're right, some people have benefited, but overall, it's around 46, 47% have lost their, their car because they've either lost entitlement altogether or they've been awarded mobility at the lower rate. So, you know, so there have definitely been a few gainers, but um, overall, 
um, it's, it's nearly half who have, who have lost out. Uh, uh, my final question, uh, on a slightly different area, um, clearly we are going to end up in regard to possibly different regulations for a lot of these benefits have been devolved compared to those in England and Wales. In regard to passporting, do we just accept that these different regulations and rules apply, and how do you think that would work in practice for assessments, particularly the relationship between DWP and the new agency? Uh, have you got concerns that you know, DWP are, are working with one rules, the Scottish agency are working with different rules, and they miss each other? And how do you think that can be dealt with at a, a, an early stage? I mean, all the new regulations have still to be made in Scotland, obviously, uh, around assessments. Uh, one of the amendments, I'm uh, glad to say that was accepted, is, is that um, people will not necessarily need to prove that they cannot walk, for example, if they're amputees, um, because, you know, that would seem an unnecessary assessment <laughs> um, now, now that that amendment uh, was made to what is now the Social Security Act. Um, so... I think there could, could well be differences between the two schemes, but as we're not taking administrative control for at least another three years, as far as I understand, I think you'll, there is time to sort out your, um, any complexities that might arise in the system and, and differences. Um, you'll, I, I would certainly be arguing for differences uh, in Scotland compared to the situation um, in uh, England and Wales, but you'll... We'll have to see what can be afforded as much as what we would like to see as a disabled people's organisation. Does anyone else, Mr Gowans, you want to come in? Yeah. Yes, I think, I think briefly it's, um, I think it's probably something that um, we considered when, um, when setting the, the eligibility criteria and the, the regulations for, um, for the new disability benefits, but it would be sort of within the gift of the um, of the Scottish Government and the Scottish, Scottish Parliament to, um, um, to set those um, for other um, passport benefits, um, um, such as blue badges and um, concessionary travel. Those are within the powers of the, of the Scottish Parliament, so there's, um, there is scope for it to be, um, um, it to be looked at and, and to make sure that there's no, nobody falls through the, falls through the cracks um, without it, it crossing over. Um, into reserve territory. Yeah, there, are, there are a number of working groups that are already established and are, are throwing up these, these types of issues, so there is ample time to identify these problems and to ensure that, that people get the opportunity to work to um, address any issues that are, that are coming forward. It's going to take willingness on the part of uh, officials and, and politicians, but that's that's their task um, and they should be held to account to ensure that that's, that's the, the way we move forward. Yeah. Can I just ask, um, the 65 age, I'm presuming that's something historically to do with age of state benefit eligibility. Is it, are there, do you know if there's any plans to change that, obviously, since you know the WASPI women in particular are now waiting until they're um, slightly older than that before they're eligible for a state pension? You know, the confusing thing is that it's not, it, the 65 isn't the barrier. It's whether you applied for a disability benefit before you were 65 or after you were 65. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anybody that's claimed uh, disability living allowance before they were 65 and got the higher rate uh, entitlement um, then and carried that over into their retirement retains the ability to lease a mobility vehicle. But somebody who, as I say, acquires an impairment or their condition deteriorates after the 65 and they only then apply or they only then realize they can apply they can only claim attendance allowance and and therefore they, they lose out but as you say they may look at that 65 uh, threshold um, in the future um, and and move it upwards in line with the retirement age um, it would seem sensible to me that they did so um, but you know there are also arguments as, as Jeremy's already alluded to that it, it seems unfair on the older generation that they cannot um, get an, an award for uh, mobility um, simply on, on the basis of the, the age when they apply. Thank you. Yeah. As a declaration, I'm in receipt of PIP myself, just for a declaration of staff. So.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Balfour. I'm going to bring in Ms. Johnson. Yeah. I'd like to follow up a couple of those issues um, on that the issue of attendance allowance, which which doesn't have a, a, a mobility component and therefore doesn't passport to the blue badge scheme and to motability. I mean, it seems to me that some of this should be reviewed. Um, our predecessor committee, each concern in a submission to the Welfare Reform Committee, our predecessor, um, said that they have been unable to find any published official rationale for why that was the case, um, that attendance allowance doesn't have that mobility component and DLA and PIP do. And they went on to say, this situation seems to imply that older people who have a disability somehow have less need to move around or less need for financial support to allow them to do so um, than those who experienced disability earlier. This is manifestly discriminatory. It means that the age of a person when they become disabled determines the support available, not the severity um, of the disability itself. Is that an understanding you have? And do, do you think we really need to be reviewing um, some of the criteria? Because it just seems, it, it does seem a bit arbitrary and random. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, the, um, the, the cut-off age for, for attendance allowance, it's something that, um, that CAB clients will, will often find, find unfair, is that um, um, because they've, um, 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 become, become disabled after the age of, um, the age of 65, that they, they don't necessarily, um, qualify for any mo mobility support. Um, there's, I think the, the, the arguments, um, I think that, that I've heard for, for having, um, that it, it, there are a broadly, um, a broadly cost-based and to do in some cases with, the effects of of the aging process, but there are um, many people who um, whose disability isn't necessarily connected to the to the aging process. For instance, um, um, the client whose um, whose wife um, 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 couldn't qualify for for the motability scheme, or um, because um, she received attendance allowance, but um, she'd recently had um, both both legs amputated, which isn't necessarily uh, um, related to the to the aging process, so I think it's it's definitely something that um, that we think should be um, should be looked at as part of developing the the new disability assistance and and whether that um, um, there should be um, mobility support for for people over sixty five as well as those those under sixty five. Okay, thank you. Is that a view shared by other witnesses? That argument still stands. Um, I think this is an ample uh, opportunity uh, to, re to do the type of review that, that you're, you're calling for. Um, there are a lot of anomalies in the system, historical, uh, which have been identified over a period of time. Uh, sometimes when you start to unpick things, it can lead to unintended consequences, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't have a look to see whether the, the changes that have been asked for because of perceived anomalies uh, wouldn't actually have opportunity costs. Um, you know, if, uh, if people are restricted from movement um, for whatever circumstances, that can lead to ongoing difficulties which will have a, a cost on health services, social services, um, and therefore by not maximising the ability for people to, to get out and about, um, could in the longer run uh, have, have more cost implications than providing the support that was necessary at the time that would have kept people active and, and kept them mobile. I mean, I suppose with disability assistance coming online in the next few years, it does seem like an ideal opportunity um, to, to get this right, um, to revisit how motability is assessed and to, you know, what we can do to ensure that everyone who needs access gets it. Yeah, I, I, as I said earlier, I think we, 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 we're creating a sort of society where it is increasingly vital that people do have means of transport and yet, you know, bus usage is, is, is falling, um, and particularly in ru rural areas, um, it, it's becoming harder for people to live there. And, and that's whether they're older or disabled people. Um, and you know that has cost implications for some people in the central belt, et cetera, because people will tend to move to where you know, they can still access services, et cetera. 
So, you know, we could look, be looking at further depopulation uh, rural areas that are, that are caused by this. So there's, there's all sorts of things that we need to think through as a society about how we address these issues, particularly because Scotland is much more rural than the rest of the UK. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, Mr Johnson here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, Convener. Thank you very much. Good morning, panel. Um, just on that point, uh, that Alison Johnson used the word opportunities, and obviously this morning going through a number of disparate uh, different aspects regard to particularly missing out on passported benefits due to not receiving the qualifying benefit and issues around whether individuals are in receipt of universal credit. I wondered if there's anything that you've not managed to touch on so far that you see as an opportunity with uh, Social Security, uh, the, the Social Security Act's implementation that would be beneficial to addressing this issue of passporting rights. I think there's a few issues that um, um, that could be um, that could be improved about the the system. I think particularly um, information sharing and um, and in some ways may automating the the process um, of um, of being able to to apply um, would be um, would be helpful um, to and that's the degree of um, of allowing information to be shared to, to pre-populate an application form, for instance. Um, I think there's um, issues that um, that we would also um, encourage a, a sort of range of applicate, um, a range of ways to apply um, for passported benefits. Um, and the case for a number of um, local authorities have, have moved to a, a digital by default system. Um, which has meant that um, that the only way to apply for for blue badges and free school meals is um, is online, which which presents a, a sort of barrier to to a large number of, of people. So that's um, that's something that um, I think it's not not necessarily um, um, that could be um, that could be done without the um, the devolution of benefits. But it's, it's certainly something that we'd we'd like to see um, see looked at and um, people being given a range of ways to apply. There's also potential uh, to use uh, the new online system to automatically award passported benefits um, to certain people, for example, the blue badge or concessionary travel, um, without having to go through a separate application process. Um, you know, you apply, and if you're awarded at the rate you know, that entitles you to those, um, or you have the condition, because you know, for, for concessionary travel, several con conditions like Parkinson's and uh, visual impairment, uh, et cetera, where you can get automatic entitlement to concessionary travel, where it, it could be just awarded by the new agency um, without the person having to go through, through that. And, and that would increase take up, reduce costs for people who really don't need those additional costs, and you'll know, essentially help alleviate poverty. Um, because we each barrier that people have to overcome, you know, you know, and it's not just learning disabled people that have problems with online usage, older disabled people, again, very, a, a, a very large proportion of them don't use the internet at all. So, you know, applying for a blue badge becomes very, very difficult, um, which it needn't be. So, yeah. I think, I think there are definitely potentials there. The other thing, I think, the Working Pensions Committee at Westminster have just completed a report on mutability. Um, and what they've pointed out is that currently um, there are three agencies involved in the, the mutability scheme, if you're not aware. Um, there's a private company, uh, Mutability Operations, and then there are two charities, one called Mutability and one called um, Ten Year anniversary um, trust um, and collectively they operate the mobility scheme but they're all supposedly separate legal entities except the private company donates its profits to the charities <laughs> you know which is a nice arrangement um, but currently the mobility operations side of the private company is sitting with um, something like 2.4 billion in reserves and that is um, 
a 300% increase on the level of reserves it held in 2008. So the potential is there for that company to offer the leases at a reduced rate <laughs> and reduce the level of reserves in that way. Um, but it doesn't want to do so. And yet it has very, very little risk because the payments are coming from the social security system. So they're guaranteed as long as the person's in receipt of the benefit. So despite the low level of risk, they've got very high level of reserves in comparison to the value of the um, cars uh, that lease. So I don't know that that isn't necessarily within your power to do something about, but it's certainly something I would like to see you raising with your colleagues at Westminster, that if the lease cost could be reduced, then many more disabled people would be able to afford to lease the vehicles. And therefore, again, we would begin to address some of the issues about you know, transportation in a modern society. I think there, there may also be opportunities, and it's not necessarily about the, the new system, but an opportunity because of the new system coming into operation that we start to address one of the biggest bugbears that affects many uh, people who work with, with people with disabilities, and that's the postcode lottery that occurs in, in delivery of services. Uh, if it's possible to have criteria set across the country but still retain flexibility at a local level, then that system is, would be ideal. But what really uh, creates difficulty is when you have nationally set criteria but the charges at, at different local authority levels are different for, uh, for people with the same uh, disabilities. That creates a lot of um, problems. So. I think there are opportunities to look at trying to reduce, if not eradicate completely, uh, the extent of the postcode lottery that affects people in terms of uh, charges and uh, income uh, disparities between one local authority area and another. Could you just give me an, an example of that, for, for instance? Well, the motability, yeah. uh, sorry, the, the blue card. I mean, in some yeah. areas there's no charge for a blue card, in other ch uh, areas there is a charge. Yeah. Um, so if you happen to live in one local authority area, uh, and you qualify for the, the, the blue card, the, the blue uh, badge, the, then, then that's great for you. But in another area, you may have to, uh, to pay for it. Um, your disability in, in the area that you, you get it for nothing may be less than in the area where you have to pay for it. So that these disparities create a, a lot of uh, annoyance, if, if nothing else. Um, when people are looking at these types of systems, the, there's an inherent unfairness um, uh, in some of the systems and, and they could be addressed. There's an opportunity now to look at that and work with local authority colleagues to ensure that um, when criteria are set across the country um, that although trying to retain as much flexibility as possible, that flexibility should be towards trying to produce more for the more services for the money available rather than saying, well, in, in this area we're going to charge you for that service where in another area you're not going to be charged for it. Yeah. Can, can I just add one other? It's the school clothing grant, which the parliament and, and the government have taken action on. Uh, the school clothing grant is really important to a lot of low-income families, um, and standardising the level of that grant is, is a big step forward. But the qualifying criteria vary from local authority to local authority. So again, in one local authority, somebody on universal credit might get it, and another one, they don't. Um, and um, again, for, for those families, you know, it's, it's no use that the grant is now standardised at £100 if you can't get access to it. So, you know, national qualifying criteria, but local flexibility in some ways and, and the way that it's delivered, yeah, that's, that's, that's what we'd like to see. You wanted a quick supplementary, Mr. Thank, uh, thank you, Convener. I suppose it's just it's that sort of continual wrestle and uh, acknowledging the, the, the specific things you've raised are a problem. What does national criteria but local flexibility look like? I suppose it's just trying to understand. I know, I mean, I hope that work is is, is underway to standardise in terms of the school clothing grant, because I, th I know that some local authorities had it at a lower level so they could provide it to more people, for example. So that, you know, that's a, a sort of local choice. But um, what does nationally set but locally flexible look like? It'd be helpful to have an example, because it, it just feels like it's a continual... With that one in particular, um, the local authority might, for example, be able, because it, it becomes a bulk buyer, um, to negotiate preferential rate for school uniform purchase. 
with a particular provider or set of providers, um, so it gets more bangs for its bucks, you know, um, and um, that would that would be helpful as well. So that that's an example of how, how a local authority could use its purchasing power through the school grants uh, clothing grant system to have a certain amount of local flexibility in, in delivering it. Uh, yeah, I guess in relation to um, the sort of free school meals and the and the school clothing grant, um, free school meals, I suppose, might be an example of um, of where um, the entitlement is set nationally, but the the delivery is is done is done locally and is, it can be done in done in a range of different ways. Um, with the um, the new um, the new minimum threshold for um, for the school clothing grant again might be might be an example of that because there would be nothing as I understand to prevent local authorities from um, um, paying a higher um, school clothing grant if they um, if they wanted to do so and if for instance if there were local circumstances where um, where the cost of, of kind of um, school clothing school uniforms um, locally was was higher or there were particular um, um, particular needs to do so, or, or even if they uh, they wanted to um, to make it make it higher. Um, the the point about um, the eligibility criteria for school clothing grants, um, I think, is is one that um, that does um, that does need to be um, need to be looked at. Um, it can vary um, quite. Um, Quite noticeably, between local authorities, most um, use the same criteria as free school meals. Um, in some, um, it's more um, more people qualify, but in some, um, um, it's um, fewer people would would qualify for a school clothing grant than, than free school meals. So that that may be something that they like, get yeah, uh, kind of what a, what an acceptable minimum minimum level for um, for qualifying for the school clothing grant, as well as the, the level of the grant might be. Um, whilst um, keeping it um, locally delivered. Mr Adam. Good morning. Uh, I'm particularly interested in what Bill, I'm going back to what Jeremy Balfour and Alison Johnson was talking when you talk about the mobility scheme and they have more flexibility. And I know it's a charity and does we, uh, first question would be, does Westminster actually have any the Parliament have any sway over it as a charity to, in order to create this flexibility you're looking for? <laughs> Um, according to the charity, no, because uh, all charities have to be completely independent of uh, political uh, influence in that way. Um, but according to the DWP uh, zone minister, um, <laughs> um, they do have a certain sway over it. Um, because when um, it was realised that there would be a large proportion of people losing mm -hmm. uh, the higher rate mobility or when they were transferred across to personal independence payment. Um, there were uh, exchanges and meetings between the charity and uh, the minister's office where um, you know, a transitional protection scheme was eventually devised where there was some compensation for those who were losing uh, the higher rate um, in the form of a cash payment uh, and, uh, you know, compensated them for the loss of the vehicle almost um, and that they could buy back the vehicle if, if it was a certain age and you know etc so there was there was a compensation scheme involved and it definitely involved meetings and um, correspondence between the minister's office and the charity um, so you know whatever the charity says it definitely there would definitely some influence and as I say although there is no public funding in, in the normal sense of the word, not a grant going to the charity or anything, all of the funds do come from a public source. So, they, you know, if it wants to continue to operate and it is a monopoly provider, mm -hmm. because nobody else is allowed to compete with them for the contract to provide mobility vehicles, um, and they do get tax concessions due to that, uh, both VAT and ins uh, vehicle insurance, which are worth about 800 million a year. Uh, quite considerable, you know, uh, tax concessions. Um, given all that, you know, there is some way of influencing how it goes about its business, I would say, as a charity and as a provider. So, um, 
Okay, so you know, I, I hope that they will address this. You know. I, I'm interested from the point of view as in a previous life, yeah. I used to work in the, that industry and yeah. uh, effectively it was in fleet in particular, in the largest fleet in the country. It used to be when I was working that 80% of the market yeah. was fleet, yeah. but it's now 50-50. But at that time, yeah. it was, and it still is, the yeah. largest fleet. So effectively, it's the largest fleet in the UK, yeah. and it can negotiate with manufacturers, find a way. That's why I find your idea about flexibility intriguing, yeah. and also the idea of possibly extending it and making people have to use the scheme as a way to get a vehicle, but they would pay extra, yeah. but it wouldn't be anywhere near as much as yeah. they were going That's in right. as Joe Bloggs off the street. Yeah. And, uh, and it, still, it still was part of the scheme of continually right. paying it and not necessarily putting any more uh, kind of financial strain on the benefit system, but making a huge difference to somebody's life and the mobility as yeah. well. Yeah. You know, so it's something that can be done. Yeah. And uh, with that buying power alone, which you quite rightly say, they could, because most manufacturers just use it as a way for market share, you know, to get their numbers up. So it's. Yeah, I, I mean, it, 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 it's considerable. And you, as you know, because you have worked in the industry as well, the second-hand vehicles as well mm -hmm. from that, you know, have a considerable influence on the cost of second-hand vehicles uh, throughout the rest of the country. So, um, you know, the Scottish government could use its bargaining power because it will be in control of the new benefits to, you know, negotiate with the mobility charity, mm -hmm. um, not un duly influenced, but hopefully influenced in some ways, about you know eligibility criteria, etc. They can set the eligibility criteria, and as you say, it would it would open up things, open up cheaper vehicles to a larger number of people, mm. um, and potentially would would have quite great benefits in terms of access to health services, other local services, yeah. retail, etc. So, you know, it seems like something worth doing and and using, you know, that power. To, to, to negotiate a better deal. It's the first time ever my previous experience in life has <laughs> been any use in this job. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Miss Valentine, you wanted? In, uh... Yeah, a um, couple of things. Uh, the first one actually is a point of clarification of interest, really, because I, I wasn't aware of it, but you referred to the um, massive reserve that you think the Metability um, private company is now holding. What does that reserve equate to in terms of their monthly operating costs? How many months are they holding? Do you know? Um, I think it's something like twice their operating cost. <laughs> so, so two years yeah. annual running costs. Yeah. So it's way above the requirements yeah. of way, the charity. Way, way above any, any requirements. And I mean, they did refer, because of the crash in 2008, they were exposed to some risk in the second-hand car market. Yeah. Um, there was about a 20% loss in, in vehicle um, you know, value. Resale value. Mm -hmm. Resale value. Mm -hmm. But you know, the reserves then coped with that more than sufficiently. Mm -hmm. And they were only around 568 million then. So, you know, there, there is definitely, I would say, the scope there for them to use more of their profit, which they're currently putting into reserves, to reduce the cost of vehicles, um, which, you know, would, would benefit. Um, a large, a very large number of people, 659,000 still on the scheme at, at the moment. Um, so, you know, widening it, um, you know, you, you could benefit potentially over a million people um, mm -hmm. and still I think, maintain an adequate level of, of profit. Okay. Well, that, that takes me nicely into sort of my next question, actually, which is around, you, you mentioned early, earlier that one of the complex issues around this is affordability that whilst we would all like to probably give everything you know, and, and answer everybody's queries, the reality is there comes a point where, where decisions have to be made. And you then also refer to, I think it was um, Mr. Mac Mac <laughs> Michael, um, said uh, around the issue around spend to save. And, and you reference that actually, if we, if we get it right in terms of what we spend and what we, we give in benefits, we can actually save a lot of money down the line. How well do you think we are equipped in Scotland to actually look at that, you know, in terms of targeting our benefits effectively so that actually we make real changes both in, in poverty and in impact on, say, the NHS or, or future opportunities for children? You know, how, how good do you think we are? Have we got those baselines? Can we make that kind of effective decision or are we slightly wallowing in, in terms of our, you know, just trying to be nice, if you like. 
I think there are enough uh, organisations, university research bodies, uh, who, who look at this type of thing. And certainly in a previous lifetime, I experienced uh, on the Finance Committee in this Parliament a lot of advice and information from organisations who do look at this, this type of issue uh, and can look at cost-benefit analysis uh, in, in terms of social services and social provision uh, and can make very positive uh, suggestions as to how things can be improved. Uh, within the health services, there are those types of analysis taking place uh, on a regular basis. So, yeah, I think the, the wherewithal is there, and, and certainly, uh, if it seemed to be lacking in any way, I'm sure that this Parliament can find ways of uh, identifying resources to, to try and uh, identify the, the types of information which would allow um, good uh, policy decisions to be made on the basis of facts and information. Um, can't in terms of mobility because mm -hmm. the research hasn't been done. Right. But in terms of free school meals, it has. Um, um, and uh, where universal provision was provided in pilot areas, children's um, level of attainment <coughs> increased by two months over their peers in schools where there was no universal provision. And so this was at primary months, school? Sorry? Is this at primary school level? Yes, at primary yeah. school level. Mm -hmm. So they were two months ahead of, of their peers at pri in, in primary school. Um, and, you know, this is partly why, you know, um, increasingly primaries one, two, and three in Scotland um, is universal provision. Um, it also improved the health, but the, the, the most marked improvements were amongst children from the lowest income yeah. households. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that, I think, if, if we've got an attainment challenge and we want to really address it, mm. then you'll address the needs of those low-income children. And again, to go back to something that I bring up regularly, according to the New Policy Institute, 49% of all children living in poverty are either disabled children or the children of disabled parents. Mm -hmm. So and it's, it's very similar levels for um, children and lone parents. Mm -hmm. um, if, we, if we can address their needs in terms of attainment through something like this, we address child poverty, we address attainment levels, and we address health issues. And again, factoring in that for the rest of somebody's life, you know, not having osteoporosis you know, when, you're, mm -hmm. when you're a pensioner relieves the care burden. Etc. So th there's all sorts of benefits that we can gain from from uni universal provision, or if not universal, based on a good low-income proxy. Can I ask, then, just just as a follow-up to that, because one of the things that struck me over the years, and probably like yourselves, I was giving evidence to the finance committee a long time ago, and and didn't see the changes that we thought we'd clearly evidence would make a difference, um, and. One of the, the problems is that joined up thinking. So free school meals work really well at primary level. When you get to secondary level, a lot of the youngsters are going down the street and they don't want to be isolated or alienated um, and they want to be with their mates and they want to go down the street with everybody else and therefore don't always use their free school meal, um, which is a real problem. And, and the same you talked earlier about um, school uniforms and we could we could do better by people by using the power of buying. But again, freedom of choice about where you buy your uniform, et cetera, means that actually that, that dissipates that ability to, to, to use that power. And I wondered how much you, you have looked at or thought about how policy needs to join up to actually make universal benefits more effective. Um, and you know where there is benefits that maybe aren't universal that we don't, um, stigmatise people who are on them and who really need them and should be using them? Um, I think the, the issue of um, is stigma is, is very important. Um, I know that, um, that some local authorities have, um, have done sort of quite a, a bit of work around um, how um, they can make um, um, reduce the the sti um, and the stigma associated with free school meals, for instance, making sure that if there are vouchers, um, that they're all the same, the same colour. Mm -hmm. It's a sort of a, um, a fairly um, a fairly simple change, but one that can make a um, a big difference to um, to avoid um, 
um, people um, people feeling stigmatised and not and not claiming the um, the support they're they're entitled to. Um, I know that um, there's a number of, of organisations have done a lot of work around this, particularly the Poverty Alliance and um, and some of the organisations that are, that are due to appear on the on the next um, the next panel. Um, but um, it's it's definitely something that um, that does need to be be carefully considered when um, um, when de both when designing benefits, but um, but also in how they're and how they're delivered is that. Um, to make sure that um, if they if they are targeted, that um, that they can be done so in a way that doesn't um, doesn't encourage stigma, because we know from from our experience that that um, that that can lead to people um, not um, not claiming all the support they're they're entitled to. Um, so it's um, um, it's it's something that's that's very important. It also got to be in mind there's sometimes a stigma attached with not having that service available. Mm. You know, yeah, a, a young person yeah. with a learning difficulty at a, a primary school may have difficulty in counting out change to pay for mm. their school meal. Mm. So you, you balance that against what potential stigma there might be in having the free school meal. Mm. Um, so there's always got to be balances taken into account mm. um, and that's why I think your starting point would be to, to extend these services widely and as universally as it's possible to do. Definitely stigma is still an issue. Um, if you look at entitlement rates and take-up rates, mm -hmm. there's quite a close alignment. Mm -hmm. um, so that if there is a very high entitlement level in an area of multiple depri deprivation, there will also be a high take-up rate mm -hmm. because there is little stigma attached yeah. because everybody's doing it. Yeah, Whereas you know, in schools where there's much more mixed intake mm -hmm. and there's a lower level of entitlement, there's a lot, much lower uh, take-up rate because the stigma attached to it is, is much higher. And these are issues we really have to, have to address. And as, as Rob says, some of them are simple. Other ones are more complex to address. And you're right, you know, mm. the, the culture, again, is go out and go to Greg's or, mm. you know, the, the chippy van or, or burger van, etc. And workers do that as well. Mm. So people, yeah. see, people mm. you know, do what they see they're, they're, they're older um, parents and older uh, brothers and sisters doing. Again, if we want to get back to a healthier eating culture, we need to address some of these issues, but it's not just to do with entitlement, it's, it's to do with the, the sort of culture and food culture that we want to, to mm -hmm. foster in, in our society. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I finally ask, um, the committee has been looking at automation, which has been mentioned today. So we've got the passporting as an entitlement, but then it's getting people to take up and how they access that entitlement uh, being an issue. And Mr Gunns, you mentioned data sharing um, with regards to universal credit and that there isn't anything as simple as a letter to say I'm on universal credit that you can take elsewhere. I was just wondering if you had any other example of those pinch points for data sharing that um, could inform us going forward? I guess the the kind of the main pinch point would be um, where sort of data is held by by different authorities. So um, so universal credit would be held by the um, by the DWP. Um, so local authority um, uh, passport benefits are administered by either by local authorities or or by the the Scottish government. So um, I know that it's it's something that's um, that's kind of been looked at in the context of the. Um, of the social security bill and the the regulations for the for the new benefits so um so that's that's something that that might want to be considered whether there's there's data sharing agreements to to make it easier for um for people to um um people to receive benefits either without without needing to to make an additional application or if if there is then it that making it as simple as as sort of yes i would like to receive these benefits that um, that it's already been established that um, that I'm in, entitled to. Um, I know that there's um, some local authorities have previously done um, done some work with their housing benefit and council tax reduction records um, to um, see who might be entitled to free school meals and school clothing grants and um, and um, and that that sort of um, works would be um, is particularly particularly positive so that um, 
um, so that the kind of the information held is, is used to um, make sure people can receive all the support they're entitled to. Okay, um, if there's no further questions, can I just thank you all for your attendance this morning um, and uh, I'll suspend briefly for three or four minutes. Uh, so I would like to welcome our next panel of witnesses. We have Anne Baldock, uh, Financial Inclusion Team Leader, One Parent Family Scotland, Mike Daly, Solicitor Advocate and Principal Solicitor for Govan Law Centre, and Hannah McCulloch, Policy and Parliamentary Officer, Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland. And a very warm welcome to committee this morning. Um, I, I thank you again for submissions um, prior to today's meeting. Um, I would just like to open with a similar question to, to what was given to the first panel, and I think you were all here to, to see that evidence session, was um, a, wh whether you think that that link between what are reserved, reserved um, social security benefits and devolved benefits um, is, is tenable going forward, and what, whether you believe there should be any changes to that. So. Um, um, yeah, Ms. Yeah, McCulloch, yeah. start. Um, so obviously, I, I work for Child Poverty Action Group, and our key key concern is addressing child poverty in Scotland. That's clearly a concern of the, the Parliament as well, given the cross-party support for the the Child Poverty Act. Um, passported entitlement provides a, a, use, a useful proxy to identify the, the right families, and it also has the potential to simplify what can be a complex process um, and to reduce administrative costs and most importantly boost take up of what are really important entitlements particularly for families on the lowest incomes and I think there has been progress over the last few years in relation to Scotland in terms of trying to simplify the landscape going forward in relation to, to best start grants um, for instance and I think we need to continue to build on, on that progress. I think the key concerns going forward in terms of that link between um, reserve benefits and, and devolved passported benefits is obviously that the passporting benefits are the, the right ones and they identify the right the right people and that those the one the people that are entitled to those passporting benefits um, are able to to access them reliably and that's obviously a big concern in relation to, to universal credit um, and I can certainly come back and, and add more detail in relation to our concerns about universal credit as a, as a reliable passporting benefit. 
Um, and secondly, we're concerned that we're, there's a, an additional requirement on top of a passporting benefit. So, for instance, the earnings threshold in relation to, to free school meals, that it's fair and it's set at the right level and it doesn't exclude families that could really benefit and did previously benefit from, from some of these um, passported benefits. Ample chance to come back in a universal credit. Mr Daly, you wanted to attend? Yes, thank you, convener, uh, and good morning. Um, I mean, Govern Law Centre's position is that I think we've got a really unique opportunity in Scotland now to enhance and improve the accessibility of passported benefits. We think that access should be streamlined, um, it should be automated uh, where possible to improve the experience of the person who's receiving those benefits. We think that that then helps uh, maximise take up, which is so important. It reduces administration and bureaucracy and the cost, so it's good for public uh, bodies too. Uh, it reduces waiting times, um, it uh, eliminates mistakes and ultimately, I think this is the key thing, is it gives people dignity in, in, so you don't have to tell your story every time you want to apply for something. And I hope we get an opportunity uh, to come on to how we can really use this opportunity to do some radical things in Scotland and our thoughts are you know, having the new Scottish uh, Social Security Agency having the ability to do proactive. So we'd heard earlier from the witnesses this idea that if you receive uh, a particular benefit, it could open the door to everything else for you. And I think that would be a wonderful thing if Scotland could have such a progressive, proactive system whereby you don't actually have to fill in lots of paperwork online or make phone calls. You do one of those things and everything opens up for you. Okay, Ms. Barber. Okay. Morning. Um, OPFS believe very strongly uh, that the link should be maintained. Um, people who are applying for passported benefits face having to try and find out what passport benefits are available. They've, there's all different rules around the threshold and they're doing this at a time when they're maybe facing quite difficult situations, for example, child disability. Um, we think that if there was a streamlined point of award, um, as my fellow uh, witnesses have already said, um, if it could be streamlined so that on the award of benefit, it is then automatically awarded the appropriate passported benefits where applicable, because not all passported benefits can be delivered at that point, um, and where it can't be delivered automatically, that the award letter should include these are the passported benefits you're entitled to. This is all you need to do to claim it. Passported benefits supplement basic benefits, which is, you know, have been frozen for the last couple of years by the national government. Um, so it's important to recognise the increase in real costs of services that these passported benefits cover. And we've got a unique opportunity to look at the levels of these passported benefits and how it affects across the country. Um, there's such a wide difference in a lot of the benefits um, that are passported, for example, as everybody's already been talking about, the uh, clothing grant and free school meals. The clothing grants the criteria for them can be different across the country, uh, especially around um, teenagers who are applying for their EMA. Uh, some councils, if they claim the EMA, their parents can't get the clothing grant. In other councils, they do, they get both. So we would like to see a conformity um, so that that links up with what's happening between the two, the DWP and the new Scottish Social Security. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Miss Maguire, you had questions around universal credit yes. previously. So Thank you, convener. And sorry, because I'm going to have to listen to the same questions again. I'll try and rejig it a little bit so it's not too dull. And good morning, panel. Um, you've heard the first panel raise some of their concerns around um, passporting from universal credit. So just be interested to hear um, your reflections. We had um, one example as well of where that the, the thresholds can kind of mean that it's a bit of a cliff edge for for families um, and potentially a disincentive to to work more hours rather than to, to have full. So I'm just over to you to hear what you want to say. Um, yeah, I think there's there's two separate issues. There's the first one is is universal credit as the the passporting benefit, and then I think slightly separate issue is the the earnings threshold. So I'll try and sort of address them separately. In terms of universal credit being a, a passporting benefit, in many ways, it is a good indicator of, of households in need. There's been an income calculation in terms of identifying um, which families are low income and, and require additional resources, but there are real difficulties with it as well, particularly in practice in how that process of using it as a passporting benefit works. Um, in terms of evidencing entitlement, for instance, it was, it was raised earlier in the session, but um, in relation to tax credits, for instance, a, a person in receipt of tax credits would receive an awards letter that detailed very clearly their income and their entitlement, um, their likely entitlement in the coming year. And that could be, um, you know, that was a, a, a tangible thing that could be, could be produced um, to establish entitlement and it's, it's not the same with universal credit where entitlement is, um, the details of that are on an online journal um, and they tend to relate to your entitlement in that the, the last month. Um, it's not a, a projection of what you'll be entitled to over the coming year. So that has the potential to cause difficulties in relation to free school meals for instance. Um, because if you're it's a slightly separate point, but if your if your income is fluctuating at all, your um, your entitlement to universal credit will also fluctuate from month to month. So you might find yourself in your, in a situation where you're on a zero hours co contract, for instance. You worked a lot in the preceding month, so in the month that you go to apply for free school meals, um, you don't have entitlement to universal credit because you just happen to get more hours the preceding month, um, and that can obviously create um, practical problems. And I think that the other important aspect of universal credit is that we know that there are, it's, it's mired in administrative problems and errors and delays. You know, one in five or, um, people who apply for universal credit won't, won't get it at the end of the, the five week period that, the, that they're supposed to. Um, so again, if that, if that period falls when you are applying for free school meals, um, you might find yourself having difficulty establishing your entitlement and as well as the delays we do have case evidence of people who um, should be entitled to universal credit and um, students in a particular in particular circumstances for instance that are just told blanket no you're not entitled so errors of that kind that then will have a knock-on impact if there's no flexibility around universal credit being um, the, the sort of be all and end all um, passporting benefit um, can talk about the income threshold, but I'd maybe come back to that if you want to. Know. I mean, Government Law Centre would certainly support CPAG's position, and our, our fundamental position is that universal credit is ultimately flawed and is a source of uh, misery uh, for people across Scotland and the UK. Uh, and it would be wonderful if it was to be scrapped. It, it, it is a source in itself of a multitude of problems. Um, the best that we can do in Scotland is to mitigate those problems. So we support, uh, we believe in universality as a, as a principle. Um, we've talked about free school meals. I remember we drafted the free school meals well back in 2000, I think. Um, and uh, other witnesses have talked about the problems with stigma. Uh, there are certain things like child benefit, free school meals, that if they become universal, you solve all these problems. Um, so I think anybody that's in receipt of universal credit um, should be eligible for free school meals. I think we could do things quite progressive like that. Um, I think the Scottish Government's already been uh, flexible and progressive. Uh, the position in terms of council tax reductions, um, the Scottish Government's introduced the ability for local authorities to estimate when somebody has a fluctuating income and universal credit. I think we need more of that type of approach. 
but ultimately the difficulty we've got universal credit if we're if we're absolutely candid is that it is creating problems that we're constantly trying to mitigate in Scotland. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, yeah, I would wholeheartedly agree with what both Mike and Hannah and the previous speakers have all said. Um, universal credit in itself um, causes problems for single parents. Um, single parents will be in a group that are particularly um, badly affected by the changes to universal credit, especially young loan parents who will no longer receive the higher rate of personal allowance under universal credit, which drops right away their income by sort of 23, 24 pound a week. So on top of that, they've then got to try and work their way through the mire of passported benefits. Um, Anything that could be done to make it an across-the-board award for people on universal credit, for both people in work and out of work, would be welcome and it would be something that would make a huge difference to single parents. And I think we have the opportunity at this time to be able to look at doing that. They've, we've done quite a lot of work with um, the government on the early years assessment and it's been great to see the amount of work that's been put into designing a system that is easy to access and looking at who needs the assessment and what's the best way to deliver it and we'd like to see that with passported benefits as it goes on. Um, <clears throat> the problems with universal credit, as Mike was saying, they're, they're varied and numerous. Um, <clears throat> but there is problems around the amount of time it takes to claim in the initial assessment. Proven um, identity is also a big problem and can be an ongoing problem. Um, there's been research, I don't have the exact figures, but there has been research to say that a lot of universal credit claims have actually been pushed back because of the need to prove identity. A lot of loan parents, for example, don't have either a passport or a driving licence, so they've got no form. So during that time, that's times when they don't have the entitlement to universal credit. Under the benefit cap, the existing benefit cap for housing costs will leave 50 pence award so that they can claim discretionary housing payment. The benefit cap under universal credit goes right the way through. It goes right down. So there's a lot of problems with universal credit. Adding to that, to the different thresholds, as Hannah was talking about, around people that are claiming what was tax credits, it's, it's just making it even more complex. So we would really support the Scottish Government putting a system in that is automated, is simple, and the thresholds are across the board. So, just to be clear, would you um, believe that the income, income thresholds are not set correctly at the moment for passporting of benefits? No, I think they're, they're too low. Okay. And other panel members have any reflections on the, the income thresholds? Um, yeah, I think um, they are um, set low and uh, the welfare rights workers at uh, CPAG have identified groups that would be excluded that are potentially vulnerable and very much in need of the passported benefits by the, in relation to free school meals, the 610 um, earnings threshold. So for instance, someone who's receiving statutory maternity pay um, receives about £145 a week 
um, that works out over a monthly period of £629 a month. So they wouldn't be entitled um, to free school meals. So that would be someone on maternity leave that might have young children at school um, very much in need of financial assistance, but, but just missing um, the entitlement. And I think wider problems with the, the threshold are, as was said in, in the last session, that it's arbitrary because at least with universal credit, the amount of universal credit for the most part that you get is based upon your circumstances. So how many children you have is taken into account, again, for the most part, um, and their particular needs. Whereas when you just have a set income earnings threshold, that's the same regardless of if you have one child or whether you have five children. Um, so it really is ar arbitrary. Um, and it does, it's a very low rate at which to set a, a cliff edge. Again, there's always going to be a cliff edge of, of some sort unless our preferred option would be universal entitlement. But in the absence of that, there's always going to be a cliff edge. But at least with when the cliff edge is your, the end of your entitlement to universal credit, that's a relatively high point in terms of income. Uh, you, you shouldn't be facing that threshold, in my opinion, when you're working 16 hours a week and not wanting to take on an extra hour in case you lose your entitlement to free school meals. Mm -hmm. I would just briefly say I, I agree with Hannah uh, and with Anne, um, but I think we need to bear in mind that with that kind of austerity uh, economic policies we've had where Social Security benefits, other than some pension ones, have been frozen, uh, people's day-to-day -day living costs have been going up exponentially. I mean, utility bills, you know, fuel goes up 5 10%, 15%. All of that's been happening. Um, the pound's been devalued by about 15% uh, because of Brexit. Um, we're an island nation. We import. People's costs of living have been going up and up and up, and yet, um, in terms of those thresholds, they're actually set quite low. So I think we do have to certainly revise those. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Johnson. Um, good morning. One of the major issues with passporting is that someone can lose entitlement to a benefit if, the, if, if they have the claim for the benefit from which they were passported, um, rejected. And in, in CPAG's um, submission, you suggest in your written evidence um, a safety net approach that provides an alternative route to access passported benefits to ensure that individuals don't lose out on those benefits because of problems with the benefit that, pro that provided the passported entitlement. Um, I'd be grateful if you could expand on, on what you mean um, by that safety net approach, and I'd like to hear from the other witnesses to their views on that. Yeah, I think there's a, 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 few, a few circumstances in which that might be useful and a, and a few ways in which it might be done. So in terms of the problems that I'd mentioned with um, fluctuating entitlement to universal credit and therefore fluctu fluctuating entitlement to passported benefits, there are a few approaches that have been taken to provide a bit of a safety net. Um, so in Highland, for instance, my understanding is that um, a family can receive free school meals for a period of eight weeks while they're waiting for uh, a decision to be made in relation to universal credit. So where there's a delay, that, that, that bridge is, is gapped. Um, sort of more comprehensive approaches, I suppose, in relation to free school meals in England and Wales, if you, are, if you were eligible for free school meals in March this year, you won't lose that entitlement until March 2022. So regardless of how your universal credit fluctuates, mm -hmm. you know you won't lose free school meals. So that provides a, a real security for families. Mm -hmm. um, and an, another area where there's been flexibility is around council tax reduction. I'm not a welfare rights worker, so it, I can come back with, with more detail in writing. But around council tax reduction, my understanding is that regulations allow decision makers to make an estimate of income, which is based on universal credit entitlement, but isn't um, stuck hard and fast to it. So if, if there is, seems to have been a mistake or there's been a lot of fluctuation, um, so if a person's income is very high one month and not, they're not entitled to universal credit, my understanding is this part of the council tax regulations would allow decision makers to use a bit of discretion and a bit of common sense around what that person's income actually is. And I think just having that space to not take universal credit entitlement as gospel could be really important in making sure that people don't arbitrarily fall off from, from being entitled. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
I would certainly, uh, we would agree with, with the, the idea of a, a safety net. And I think if the, Scots, the Social Security Agency could produce some national guidance, uh, which could help those bodies that are issuing passport benefits, um, really what I, I suppose I'm thinking, Ms Johnston, is this idea of transition in people's lives. So people who are wanting to get on in life, get into work, um, the reality is that you, know, you have to wait a month, let's say, before you get paid. You have got that transitional period that Hannah's talked about where it might be quite tough you know, for a number of weeks before you can get everything running smoothly. So if we were to have some sort of national approach that recognises transition in life um, where you lose a passported benefit doesn't mean that immediately you don't need it anymore. It means you need actually to have that until that, that period, whether it's weeks or whatever. That you, you you know that you're then actually okay. I think that would be extremely valuable if we had a kind of a, an approach across Scotland to do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I certainly agree. Um, as Hannah was saying, the idea that they use for the council tax reduction is is a very good model of of how that works. Um, when somebody comes off some benefits, there are a run-on of housing benefit and council tax reduction for a short period of time. Um, the entitlement to passported benefits, if it was also included in that, would, as Mike's saying, act as a buffer just for those transitions where people are having to wait four weeks to be paid to four weeks, but we'd need to have the universal credit recalculated because of um, the entitlement to childcare, etc., etc. During that period, um, if there was, if there was a buffer zone or any transition, it would it would make a big difference. Mm -hmm. I mean. It sounds as if we do have opportunities here to, to improve the system. Um, um, I'd kind of like to discuss the issue of national administration because there's a very large number of passported benefits and they are administered by, by various organisations. For example, the Scottish Legal Aid Board administers passporting to Legal Aid and Transport Scotland, assesses your eligibility for concessionary travel. Um, for benefits with national criteria, do you think that it would make sense to administer these centrally through the new Scottish Social Security Agency? There's an attraction to that. I mean, I, I think um, if we look at, say, passported benefits, as you said, in terms of legal aid, the, the various local government, NHS, NHS Scotland, Transport Scotland, wouldn't it be wonderful if the Scottish Social Security Agency could have, uh, through its IT system, the ability to enable all those other passported benefits to kick in? You know, so there was there was one. Now, if you've got the DWP in terms of UK benefits, it would also be wonderful if there could be some sort of arrangement with the DWP to make that happen for everything. Um, I suspect that would take some time, but we do have some time anyway. So all of these things, if you think about it, now that we have this opportunity, and it doesn't come along very often, why don't we design the system to fit the individual uh, consumer, um, the individual person? so that it makes things as easy as possible. And I think the benefit to um, uh, public bodies and local government um, is that actually it streamlines their whole administration process. So, so th there's a lot of opportunity here, not just to, to improve the experience of the, of, of the individual receiving passport benefits, but actually to streamline the whole of the system in terms of all of the different um, uh, organisations involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, given the focus that we had on independent advocacy through the passage of the Social Security Bill, it, it would make sense, wouldn't it, if, if that independent advocate was dealing with one form at one time that led to, you know, otherwise, yeah, it just seems remarkably inefficient, potentially, Yeah. if, if we keep asking people to fill in different forms at different times. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we necessarily have a position on who is delivering the benefits. I think it's all about the, the experience of the, the individual and if there's a way to ensure, you know, minimum entitlement, um, automation where possible and support with claims. It, it's less important to us who, who's doing that as long as 
from the perspective of the person it's using the system, it's, it's straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think there's a, an opportunity in relation to how accessing these passported benefits can feed a person into the wider system, into information and advice. So we know, for instance, with Best Art grants, um, families will be able to access those at the point of a child being born, at the point of that child starting nursery, and at the point of that child starting school. So that might be a way to um, use contact with universal services at those points as a as a, um, a way to direct people through to to information, advice, and, and wider entitlement. So there is an element of that, that contact with that local contact with people, perhaps serving a purpose as well. Thank you. Thank you. If there is a, a conformity, and it's a case of you've got whatever your award is, you've got your passported benefits here, it's straight through, it's streamlined, there's a connection obviously between the two different systems. It's going to make it easier for people that are applying for these benefits, it's going to make it easier for people that have to advise and support um, people who are maybe then having to put in appeals, whatever. Anything that can streamline it, make it easier, has to be welcomed. It would also be welcome if any applications for passported benefits is made on different platforms. Universal credit can only be um, accessed through um, a web-based system. Single parents can have particular difficulties in getting access to digital um, forms. So if it could be made that there's different ways of applying for the one benefit that's going to cover everything and it's administered at the one place, it has to be it has to be a big improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Ms. Ballantyne, you want to so I just wanted to pick up very quickly on, on a point that you were making there about national conformity and, and you know, whether it comes through and that's it, you're, you're entitled and everybody gets that same entitlement. And I was just wondering, I was just thinking as, as it was being said about transport, um, I mean, I live up a valley where there was no transport, public transport whatsoever, um, and it wouldn't matter how far you could walk, you, could, you couldn't access anything without having a car. So, so motability, for example, would be really important in, in that instance. Um, but then I, I've got friends who can walk out their door and there's literally a bus stop outside the door and they can get to anywhere very easily. So I was wondering, therefore, if you're talking about national conformity and local flexibility, how you, you marry that? Because if it comes through as a national conformity, my worry is that those who need it the most might find themselves getting less than they need and those who don't need it quite as much are getting slightly more than they need and therefore nobody's quite winning and I think this is something we're going to really wrangle with over the next two three years is, is how you build that fairness into the system so that people are getting what they actually need. And I think you're right that ultimately everything has to be paid for so everything has to be costed and mm -hmm. it is ultimately a matter for policy to say this is these are the parameters that we set. I mean, Governor Law Centre's position is we should set the parameters as wide as possible mm -hmm. because that that works in terms of take up and prevention. Um, and so, but in terms of your specific point, I think we do need to give, uh, for example, local government discretion. But I, I would suggest the discretion should be to go over and above what we accept as a minimum um, level uh, safety net, if you like. Um, uh, across the country. Because one of the problems we have is this kind of postcode lottery. So, for example, Scottish Welfare Fund, mm -hmm. uh, administered by local authorities, it varies from time to time during, during the year mm -hmm. in terms of pressures on budgets, whether you can get a crisis grant or not. Now, whatever we can do to try and make that uh, more consistent would be helpful. But, I mean, I take your over, overall point, which is at the end of the day, everything has a cost. Um, but... It was about need, actually, need. rather than cost. It's about making marrying need so that what you're getting is what you need rather than a sort of 
everybody gets that regardless of where they are. Uh, yeah, but I mean, I suppose we're not talking about universality when, when it comes to passport benefits. I mean, there are, there are a criteria, and I think by their very, uh, you know, very nature, uh, the, 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 in order to get passport benefits, you have to be on a particularly uh, low level of income. So I think, I'm not quite sure that the issues about the need is problematic, given that by definition, to, to access these things, you have to have the need. There's a level of need, I suppose. Uh, my, my example was that, yeah. that business, of, yeah. for example, with transport. Yeah. That yes, you know, everybody's got that level of need, if you yeah. like. But if you live, if you live miles from any public transport, and therefore yeah. there is little or no option. And, and even your taxi allowance, if you like, yeah. would be used up incredibly quickly yeah. compared to if you, you live in the centre of a city where you yeah. can easily access and everything's relatively yeah. close to you and you can easily access. I mean, that's so, an argument so, for... So the need is very yeah. different, say, in, in um, motability type access. Yes, mm. but we're kind of going on and perhaps to the need for better public infrastructure in terms of transport and perhaps you know, nationalising um, the provision of transport. Yeah. Lovely cost. <laughs> I'll let you move I'll on. I'll move swiftly on from that one. Uh, uh, Mr. Balfour, you wanted it. My question was on similar lines, so it's been answered. Thank you. Any? Uh, Mr. McPherson. <laughs> thank you. Very, ju just uh, very briefly, uh, Mr. Daly, I, I wondered if there's anything more you wanted to say about legal aid, just given the nature of your work. Um, I think the position in terms of legal aid in Scotland um, uh, is not perfect. Um, it's, we, we, we have a, a soft cap, but it, certainly in terms of the passporting uh, position, uh, for those in receipt of certain benefits, it is a fairly simple streamlined process uh, where you don't have to fill in a complicated financial form two, uh, to, to the Scottish Legal Aid Board. So I think that actually works really well. But I don't, I don't want to necessarily stray on to talking about legal aid in, in, in the generality. But certainly in terms of this committee's interest in terms of passporting, I think it works really well. Yeah. Good to have that clarification. Thank yeah. you. Ms. Valentine. Just one last one. This is, this is a curiosity question to some degree. Um, Mr. Daly, you said in your evidence that you would completely scrap universal credit, that it didn't work in your opinion, but you also said that it's not working for one in five. So the, the implication being that for 80%, it's, it's you know, as good as any other system was working, if you like. So what is it you want? If, if you don't want a universal, you know, one application into the system, are you wanting to go back to separate applications for all different things? I'm, I'm, I'm just curious as to how you perceive it should look? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I mean, we've been talking about um, f uh, one application process to access a range of different things. Mm. So I'm not quite sure that the question you pose is necessarily the, the correct premise in terms of passporting. I think one of, the, one of the key difficulties in the design of universal credit has been that it's been used as an opportunity to actually do very regressive things. So it's not just about, for example, the idea of I mean, because universal credit as a concept is actually a wonderful concept. You know, let's have a, a single uh, process for, for social security. But the reality is that's not what happened with universal credit. And, and one of the big concerns that we have at Governor Law Centre is the way that social security benefits are administered by the DWP is they get things wrong all the time and they do things incredibly uh, inhumanely in terms of the assessment for, for example, for medical uh, evidence. So, for example, some of the, some of the figures are, are in about 90% of mandatory reconsiderations. So, so where people challenge the decision of the DWP, 90% are over, overturned uh, in terms of mandatory reconsiderations. When it comes to appealing to the first tier tribunal, 60% of appeals are successful. So what that tells you is we've created a system where the DWP get it wrong all the time, exclude people from what they're entitled to, and create misery. That's why we've got an opportunity to do something absolutely different. I answer the question as to what, but I'll leave that with you. <laughs> Can uh, Mr. Adam here? Yeah? Supplementary in the back of what Mike just said there, because that is that is the debate we're having. That's what we need to be looking at: is the way we have this opportunity. It will be difficult, 
there are challenges, data, everything else that we're going to have to share with DWP and everyone else, but Benefit Systems has been looking for this one-stop shop. This holy, it's almost the holy grail of the Benefit System for decades. And uh, this is probably the first time we've had a chance to relax, pause, and keep, maybe look at ways of delivering it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of backing what Mike's saying here. Is it not just the case that we should be looking at ways to try and make this work? But it is extremely difficult because there are so many challenges out there with the DWP, with data in particular, you know, even some of the benefits we're getting, some of it's even manually based, uh, the benefits that the Scottish Government will be getting. You know, so the, uh, sharing that and getting that over is going to be a major challenge for us as well. I mean, I completely agree. And I mean, to get philosophical, if I can, I think the law is, is itself, when we design the law, when the law is passed by Parliament, or at Westminster, it's a manifestation of political choices. And those manifestations are often quite discriminatory. We don't want to give help or resources to this group of people. Mm -hmm. And I think the social security system in the UK has done that, and it's got progressively more and more discriminatory against groups of people, women having more than X number of children. So the opportunity we have in Scotland is to start the whole process from thinking about the human being and how could we do the very best for that individual and you're absolutely right um, it is complicated and it, there, there is no sort of easy solution but if we start with that premise which i think is what we're doing in scotland then that is going to create a much better system than we currently have okay. are there any further questions uh, can I, I thank you all for your attendance at the committee this morning it's been extremely helpful for our deliberations and um, i will suspend briefly for two minutes thank you